Robert Feldman. It's good to have all of you here today. Um, there, you know, pff, my goodness, there is a lot happening right around this time. Of course, we have uh, Valentine's Day, and you can see the beautiful display that uh, Mary Cannell has put together here, as well as, uh, you know, just a, Valentine's Day, I know that a lot of people say, well, that's a, it's a commercial holiday and everything like that. Well, if you, <laughs> if you need a reminder to put love first, then something, this is a good way to remember those in your life that you love and to return that to them. And so we have that. And also, and this actually just honestly hit me. I had forgotten that it was even happening today is the Super Bowl. <laughs> I mean, honestly, um, if the Packers or the Steelers aren't playing in it, I really don't have much of a dog in the fight when it comes to it. But um, enjoy it. Enjoy it. It was something that I grew up enjoying with my family, and it's always uh, a, a wonderful time to enjoy with others as well. And so if you look into your news in the pews today, you'll see several different new announcements. Looks like Ministry of Missions is um, collecting diapers and wipes for care net pregnancy services of Quincy. So if you are able to give to that, that would be wonderful. Um, there are other announcements that you can look and see and hear as well. Um, Matt, I believe you have one. Good morning. Today is a cinnamon roll Sunday for the youth group. Uh, we will have cinnamon rolls at both doors after church. Uh, we appreciate the support of the congregation as we continue to raise money for kids to go on trips. Our next trip is Young Christians Weekend, which is back on this year. Uh, fantastic. The kids are very excited to go and go to the rallies and things like that that are going on. We'll be going to that at the very beginning of April, and we will also have either muffins or cinnamon rolls every Sunday in March. Uh, so today and then every Sunday in March. Thank you. Amen. Amen to that, and I'm uh, very excited for that, actually. <laughs> so just keep in mind that all donations go directly to the, the kids and getting them out and going to different events, and I love seeing these new events coming back in. Is, I mean, isn't it great to see that happening once again? It just seems like we're healing from all of this and getting back into the swing of things. And so that's very good. And so let us uh, worship the Lord together as we are here today. Let us stand with one another. And if you look into your bulletin today, we'll see the call to worship. <clears throat> now our call to worship today is found right in Psalm 1. And I will read the fine, and you read the bold, right in the bulletin. And this is what the word of the Lord says. It says, Blessed is the one who, who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and whose mandate on his law, uh, meditates on his law day and night. That person But not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hymn number 269, He Lives. Jesus lives today, 
He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He And talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Eternal Alleluia to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Please join with us this day to pray and sing praises to God. We bow our heads now. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We ask that you think of our families here at Central. Pray for those who are, all, are ill or giving, grieving. Let us all be there to encourage or give help where needed. Our Father, watch over our police and military and keep them safe. Give our leaders wisdom for the safety of our country. Thank you for those who serve here at our church. May we be blessed as Pastor Jason brings us the message so that we will take it to heart. Let us go out to share your love with others. May they be blessed, fully knowing others who share the hope you have given us. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated, please, and turn to hymn number 491, Shine, Jesus, Shine. light of the world shine upon us set us free by thy truth you now bring us shine on me shine 
But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Mm -hmm. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is brutal. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and the first roots of those who have fallen asleep. For our response, let's sing a stanza of Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult.
Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives while restless sing. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christians, follow me. As Miss Cindy comes to lead our children's time, let's sing, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Let's have a moment of prayer for our Thanksgiving offering, our offering today. Let's pray with today and thanks for, for that offering. A thousand stars light up the skies at night and the morning sun brings new life to another day. Love has a single flame, the glow that kindles in the eyes at the mention of Jesus' name. May you give with a grateful heart for the work that is done here in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. We are now on the last section here of the book of Colossians. In fact, I will be finishing up that book today, and then we will only have one more book to go to finish up the, uh, the prison epistles, and that is a very small book called Philemon. And so we'll be taking a look at that this next Sunday. But very excited to kind of be getting through all of this and just the journey that we've taken um, in this, uh, this sermon series of uh, finding freedom in chains and even while Paul is locked up, even while Paul is kind of confined, and that sounds very familiar, doesn't it, to many of us, he was still able to have hope, still able to have joy and peace. And today is a little bit different in our Scripture, because as I read this Scripture, you'll come to think to yourself, how is this going to relate to anything? Well, it does, and we'll get to that. So let's read Colossians 4, 7 through 18. This is what the Word says. It says, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and follow, fellow servant in the Lord. And I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. And my fellow prisoner... Um, Aristarchus sends, his, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And you have received instruction about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is also called Justice, uh, also sends greetings. And these are, on, these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort for me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and those in the Odyssea and Hierapolis. And our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters of the Odyssea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And after this, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Ar Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry that you have received from the Lord. And I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, Instant messaging and emails, they weren't really a thing back then. I mean, sure, there were quick ways to communicate, like through a phone or a landline, but if you wanted to get a hold of somebody, it was a very, very long way away. My parents told me that it would cost a lot to do that. <laughs> and so I was taught that I had to write out to my friends using letters. And so I had several of these so-called pen pals. You ever, ever, ever had a pen pal? a pen pal growing up, and all it would cost was the price of postage and the time in uh, waiting for a response. And I remember writing to kids that I had known from bases that I had lived on prior, and even other kids in Spain who really didn't speak very good English, but would use the letters to practice with. We would practice our Spanish and our English with each other. And these were very personal and often messy letters with plenty of mistakes and spots from whatever may have been on the table when I was writing it, you know, and, uh, but they were precious. They were precious to me. They were precious to them. And when I got to college, my future 
bride and I would often write each other letters just to be more personal with each other. And at the time, we did have email. We did have instant messaging. But there was something rather endearing about receiving a handwritten letter from somebody that you love, and we both still have copies of those letters saved in little boxes in our homes. You see, I'm not sure what it is But a handwritten letter just seems to speak louder than anything that is digitally rendered today. It takes only a few minutes to write out an email and send it to someone, but it takes much, much longer to actually articulate something letter by letter with your hands, doesn't it? And it seems like such an impression on a page says more than just a normal email that is written in haste. Because we get those. Any of you who work in an office, you have to write dozens of those every single day. They don't mean as much as receiving something that is handwritten. You see, Paul was, not, was someone who not only knew how to write a good letter, but he also knew how to make it personal. You see, a large portion of the New Testament, actually a solid 25% of it was written by Paul. And all of his writings were letters. In each one of his letters, we're going to a specific audience, and that included the letters that were written to the Colossians. And that is why when you get to the end of the letter, like we have in Colossians, we are met with various names and places that we may never have heard of before. It may be very odd to us. And the question is this, though. Is it still important to read these sections? Because we get to these sections, don't we? We get to these sections with these hard names in places that feel like it doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, connect to us. Do we still read them? Do we still apply them? You see, when reading the Bible, you are going to come across many places where it seems like the content has no significance to you whatsoever. And it feels like overhearing a conversation that has nothing to do with you, right? You've had that before, where you listen in and you're hearing a conversation that has nothing to do with you. So why are you eavesdropping? But when it comes to the Holy Scriptures, it actually does. It actually does apply to you. Because since you are bound in Christ through faith by grace, you are also bound to the words that are found in those Scriptures. But they must be seen in context. I have taught behind the pulpit many times to read the Word of God. I have said, you need to read your Bible, you need to read your Bible. But very rarely, and I feel like I, this is, and I kind of want to apologize to you about this, I haven't really taught you how to read the Bible. Because it's more than just picking up the book and reading the words. There is a form to it. There is a way to read it, a way to take in the information, and it has to be done within context. So today we are going to use the example of Colossians 4 to learn how to read the Bible in context. And what, does it, what it means to apply the Scriptures to our lives even when they don't seem to do so. So let's look at this. Here's our first point today, and this is something that I tell my Bible uh, study all the time, but it's something I don't know if I've actually said to you. But here's, here's the first point. When reading the Bible, you are reading someone else's mail. You are. You're reading someone else's mail. Now, it is a love letter written to us, of course. We understand that, but in context, it was originally someone else's mail. When you move into a new house or a new home, it's good to get your mail switched over at the post office, because you do this at the postal service so that they can update the registry of where you live so that you will receive the right mail. And even if this is done on time, and this has probably happened to you as it has happened to me many times, that does not guarantee that the right mail will get to your mailbox. Sometimes a letter comes and there's a different name on the envelope even though it is your current address. And in that case, you would, and I hope you would do this, Take the envelope to the post office and ask them to return it to the sender. Now, suppose that you don't do that. Okay, suppose you don't do that. Suppose you get the letter 
And you can tell that it's personal. It was written very personally to someone else, and you go ahead and you open it anyway. All right? You have no idea who the letter is supposed to go to, nor do you uh, know who the letter is coming from, but you want to read it to see if you can figure it out on your own. Now, aside from this being uh, very wrong, <laughs> it's also confusing. It's also confusing. Because you are not going to know what any of the context is in which what is being written is being written, or why it is being written. So, what you do is you try to fill in the gaps with what you know about these people, which is relatively nothing. And with that limited knowledge in the back of your mind, there's a good chance that you will not get a solid picture of what the letter is really talking about. Now, in ancient times, letters and notes were regarded as important documents and were often kept safe and preserved so that future generations could read them and learn about what it really meant to live in that day and time, those many years ago. Most of our major archaeological findings concerning history of the world and how things happened are based on obtaining letters. On based on those. Because researchers and scholars are usually less concerned on what was verbally said than what was written. Because to write something down, to inscribe it on a wall, or scribe it on stone, or papyrus, or anything like that, means that you are attempting to create a record of thoughts and events that are very important to that time. And the written word is actually very meticulous. Especially the ancient written word. Because it is rarely expressed out of spite or rage. Because once you write something down, it's down. Forever. And keeping all of this in mind, you can see why the letters that were written by Paul, and actually, historically, it was a scribe that would write Paul's letters, especially when he was in prison. Because at the very end of that passage of Scripture that we read today, he says, this greeting I write in my own hand. Because he was having a scribe actually writing everything. So he was dictating what was to be written. Okay, so the scribe would write it down. It was also believed, scholars believed, that Paul had very messy handwriting. He had, he had doctor's handwriting. No offense, Dr. Wells. Um, no, no he, he had, he had the, the, the messy handwriting. He, had the, he was very professional and he did a lot of that, but he was very quick with his handwriting. And so, you can see that uh, there's context here. It was custom of the age to hire scribes. Scribes were very important to copy the important documents word for word and then allow for the patrons to distribute the copies as they see fit. And in a way, it is sort of like the... It, it, it's sort of like an ancient book publishing. And it was incredibly accurate. Very, very accurate. Because you see, we don't have copies of the original letters in the Bible. We don't have a single one. We don't. Okay, we have copies of copies. But that doesn't mean that they're inaccurate. These scribes were professionals, and to mess up purposely on a document wouldn't just get them fined, they could even get jailed for it. And that seems like a stiff penalty for a typo, but these people took recording their history very, very seriously. So when you come across sections of Scripture with names and places that are unfamiliar to you, that gives you the opportunity to study more to find out exactly what those places and who those people were. Let's take the example of 1 Corinthians 16, 19-20. This is what it says. It says, The churches in the providence of Asia send you a greeting. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, what we see here is a perfect example of Paul using a person's name, using people's name, to connect to those who are receiving the letter. And just at face value, you can see that there are two individuals who appear to have a vested interest in the Corinthian church. And what this verse doesn't tell you is that Priscilla and Aquila, 
They were Roman refugees that met Paul in Corinth and worked with him to establish the church and even traveled with him for a time. They became tent makers together. And the Corinthians would have known who these two people were. They would have been very close to them. And, they know, and they're known as the original husband and wife ministry duo. Priscilla often being named first because her assumed role as a deaconess and a pastor in different churches. She's one of the reasons why we allow for women in ministry within the church because the Bible, within context, supports that. So with them being named in this letter, we can take a deeper look into the lives of the Corinthian people and thus be able to understand the reading of the Scripture the way that they do, seeing it through first century eyes. Make no mistakes. The the Scriptures are timeless. They're timeless. But they are the writings of individuals who lived in the first century and even before that time. And these are, not, these are not people with all the luxuries of life that we enjoy today. They didn't have warm showers to take or lights that can illuminate a room with a flick of a switch. Pretty much everything that we enjoy in this world today was not accessible to them. So our reading of the Bible should be as someone who never drove a car to get anywhere or has never seen a refrigerator has never used a refrigerator to keep their food from spoiling. We need to look at it through first century eyes. And that's hard to do in today's day and age. Because, well, we have so much. (laughs) We really do. But that brings us to our second point, is that the Bible itself was meant to be read as it was written. It is actually, there's an objective truth in it. And I'm going to kind of get to what that means here in just a moment. Have you ever wondered why it takes us pastors so long to get through Bible college? (laughs) Because it does. It took me like, took me four years to get through regular college, Bible college, and then another three years to get my master's degree. Why does it take that long? Well, it takes that long because the Bible is not only a book with spiritual insights, but it is literally a historical document with plenty of details that help us to understand more about the ancient world. The Scripture has accurately recorded over 2,000 years of history of not only the Hebrew people, but of the foundations of this very world. And the texts within the Scriptures have been used to find the sites and and cities and ruins over the years and has even led to the discovery of a people called the Hittites, a people whose existence was actually doubted well into the 20th century. The Bible led archaeologists to where the ruins were by suggesting that they were positioned in southern Canaan because of the order in which the Hittites were mentioned in Hebrew documentation. Even to this day, people are finding the Bible that it states scientific facts that were not understood back in those days. Scientific facts. Facts like gravity, the water cycle, and even the core of the earth. Listen to this in Job 28.5. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Now, I'm sure that the people reading this great poem would see this and have kind of an alternative spiritual meaning to place within this passage, but it's actually very literal. We know that there is truth to this statement because deep below the earth's crust is an ever-burning fire which fuels our planet and has helped it to, to become the form that it currently is. However, this passage was given many, many years, thousands of years before tectonic science was even a study. And that was during a time in which the popular belief of the age was that the earth was on the back of a giant turtle. I mean, think about it. Normal human understanding would not have brought these people to this conclusion. But rather, it could have only have come from someone who already knew the truth. And that is God Himself. I mean, looking in the New Testament, 
we can see that the Scriptures and their audience have broadened quite a bit. Once, there was, once it was a word that was given to God's chosen people, Israel, the writings of God's new covenant, the, those new covenant prophets, or as we call them, the apostles, was something that was open to all people, open to the Gentiles as well. And it was for that reason that someone from the 21st century can read what was written to a Christian from the 1st century and see it equally as the Word of God. So when we read what was written back then, we can see it equally as the Word of God just as they did. However, that doesn't change the fact that the words within the Scriptures are to be read as they were originally intended to be read by the original author. This is important. This is very important. I need you to listen to this. To explain what this means, we need to define, define something called objectivity. You ever heard of this? Objectivity. Do you know the difference between something being seen subjectively and something being seen objectively? When someone sees something subjectively, they are seeing it through their own views and their own understanding, their own values. Basically, if a meaning is something subjective, all right, then that meaning will be different for everyone because they'll see it differently. It will be very, uh, it will be very nuanced. It'll be very based on themselves. Think of abstract art. I might see, I don't know, I might see a pig in this picture, and you might see an old lady. All right, you might see, I might see a bug, and you might see a car. Objective is the opposite of this, because there is only one meaning, one meaning. And that meaning is usually reserved to just the meaning that the author chooses. So when it comes to scriptures, we see a little bit of both of this happening. Because the Word of God is living and active, okay? We believe this, right? Because it says it right within the scriptures. It's living and active. It moves and grows with the reader in different ways depending on who the reader is. But the original intent, however, is the one that we are able to interpret the Bible on, and we must interpret it on the original meaning. Another good example of this is found once again in 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks to a church about prayer practices. Listen to this passage in 1 Corinthians 11, 4-6. And determine for yourself what it says. This is what it says. It says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with his with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. Hmm. As I'm looking around, I do not see too many women wearing hats. Not Actually, I see no women wearing hats in here. If we were to look at this through 21st century eyes, we would think that all women have to enter the church, must be wearing a head covering, like our Mennonite friends. This is where they get this, by the way. Must be wearing a head covering to be in the presence of God, or their leaders, or men, or anybody. But... That is why we read the Scriptures in context, or as the readers understood it. The hair of a woman in that area, back in that day, would be what many men would consider hmm, a stumbling block. Because it carried with it an attractiveness that was really only reserved for the husband to enjoy. The city of Corinth also had a very large temple. Two temples, in fact, a temple to Artemis and a temple to Aphrodite. And these temples were uh, run by prostitutes who would go into other houses of worship and gather up men and seduce them. And Paul doesn't explicitly say this in his letter, but the historical fact remains that this was a part of Corinth life. In fact, it was the part of Corinth life because... There was a phrase back then, and I'm not kidding, what happens in Corinth 
stays in Corinth. No, seriously, it's the whole Vegas thing. That is the actual phrase that was used in Greek. <laughs> These things need to be taken into account when reading the Scripture. That this was the original sin city. And the women back then were told to not provide stumbling blocks for the men. So when you read the Bible, you must read it as it was written. Objectively based on the original intent of the author. Unfortunately, we do not have the Apostle Paul and the rest of the biblical writers on speed dial to ask them what they were really thinking at the time that any of this was written. That is when another more elusive factor must intercede into the reading of God's Word. And that brings us to our last point, is that we must interpret the Word of God with the help of the Holy Spirit. It has to happen. The term dead language is used to denote a language or a linguistic form that is no longer in use in the world. Like it's no longer around. And one of the most widely used languages in the ancient times was Latin. Latin. By which many of the English translations of the scriptures were translated from. So the ancient Latin was uh, spoken by most of Asia and Europe for centuries. And it slowly morphed into other languages like French and German. And it even melded with other languages, northern languages like Celtic and Gaul. And created... English. But before that, however, there was the Greek language, and more specifically, Koine Greek, in which the New Testament was written in. It, too, is a dead language. Latin, as we know it, is a dead language, and, and uh, Koine Greek is a dead language. Now, if you were to go even back further into the days of the ancient Egyptians that spoke Coptic, and the Sumerians that spoke Sanskrit, you would come across a very primitive yet very expansive language called Hebrew. All of these languages in their original forms are dead. They're not used anymore in public. And so those who know how to read them are becoming a commodity. Now the languages in which the entire Bible was originally written, they are all dead, and many consider that to be quite problematic, <laughs> as it is for scholars. Of course, it's easy to think of this as a deal breaker for saying that we have the Word of God sitting right in front of us, right in our pews. We have that. That Bible is the Word of God. But you see, Bible scholars have helped preserve the Word to the closest rendition of the original as possible. Thousands upon thousands of them. And these are men that I believe that God had anointed to be able to do this. Plus, there's this little thing called the Dead Sea Scrolls. You ever heard of it? Which was discovered back in 1946 and contains old copies of many of the Old Testament books that we have in our Bible. And those scrolls are nearly identical to what we have in our Bible. Translated, it, translated into English, they're, they're almost identical. And some of them were written nearly 3,000 years ago. There's a pretty good case for scriptural integrity. And with all of that said, the work of the translators, the scholars, the historians, they can only go so far, only so far into interpreting the words of the Bible. They really can. Because the Bible is not the same as other ancient documents. The reason that it has endured much longer than so many other ancient documents, is because it is spiritual in nature. It's spiritual in nature. It's different than all the other books. Though the words on the page are seen in our own language, it is the meaning behind those words that is endearing. It's the message of love and hope that one can have through a risen Savior. And since it is, the, is spiritual in nature, it is the Holy Spirit that is needed in order to accurately interpret and use what is written in these texts. Jesus himself can actually attest to this. As he was the one who proclaimed the coming of the Holy Spirit before it arrived, 
Listen to John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you in all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. And as you can see, the Holy Spirit, which has been granted to all believers, is the one who will open all of our eyes to the truth. And that truth includes what was written directly in Scriptures. It is my belief and understanding that the Lord has preserved the integrity of the Scriptures through the use of the Holy Spirit, and He will continue to do so up until Jesus Christ returns. Because I do not believe that God will let His Word slip through the cracks of history. There have been many, many cultures that have tried, haven't they? During Nazi Germany, they would grab Bibles and all sorts of types of books and throw them in large fires to burn them all. Because they were trying to erase history, they were trying to reform it in their own image. The Bible is a beautiful piece of history. It speaks of God's provision to His people, the Israelites. and also speaks of the redemption of mankind through Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. That is something that is never going to be lost. Because there's another aspect within the Bible. There's a, another theme that is often talked about within the Scriptures that's called a remnant. And God always provides a remnant. You see, the world could be fading away. The world could be passing away. It could be on fire right now. And the very words of God would be one thing that would not pass away. They will never go away. Though Bibles may be taken from us, though they may be burned in the fire, the Word of God endures. And God, I truly believe, is going to keep, keep it strong. He's going to keep it from going away from our hearts. He's going to provide ways for us to receive His Word. And so a little bit of a different prayer today is to pray not just that people would receive the Word of the Lord, but that the Word of the Lord would remain in people's reach. That's something that I pray. Is that the Word of God, that the Bible that we have will remain in the reach of people. That governments and authorities are not going to silence its delivery to those who so desperately need it. Everybody. So let us pray. Father God, we pray that the integrity of your scriptures are maintained. Lord, we pray also that your word would not return void, as we know that it won't. That God, as we deliver the scriptures, we deliver the word to others. Father, I pray that they will take that, they will read it, and that it will develop within them. Perhaps, Father, there are those who have been wondering about you, who have been curious about that salvation that I continue to talk about every single Sunday. Lord, I would pray that they would come forward to receive you. Perhaps they're wondering about this church, this congregation, and being a part of this wonderful body. Father, May they come forward to join this congregation. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what we have. May we not take it for granted. Teach us how to understand it. Teach us how to read it to its fullest. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. But Father, also, we pray this prayer to you. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. There's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. felt led to offer this. Um, if you know of somebody who is in desperate need of a Bible, that they want one or that they need one, just come to me um, or come to one of the deacons. I would imagine that we would be able to provide you one from this church or um, any that are available because the Bible's not out of reach. It should be out of reach for anybody. It should be right there. And so Let's, let's be that. Let's provide that for everybody. So may God bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you. May He lift His countenance to you and bring you peace. Let us pray. Father God, guide us out into the world. Lord, with Your words on our lips, with them buried deep in our hearts so that we will not forget them. That though man may try to take it from us, that it will still endure strong within us. Let the love that you have shown us through Jesus Christ flow through us this week. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.